now we are going to the next session uh, the next session is uh, handled by the star of this efcs program the proud alumni of saru college and the department of chemistry saru college patma shri professor pradeep uh to uh, say a few words about pradeep professor pradeep is an institute professor at indian institute of technology the uh, uh only six uh, he is uh, among the 600 faculty members he is one of the six institute professors of iit madras he is also deepak paresh institute chair professor and also professor of chemistry he, after his early studies in uh, university of calicut uh, farooq college and under calicut university indian institute of science he is phd then uh, post doctoral studies in university of uh, berkeley and purdue university his interests are research interests are in molecular nanoscale materials and he develops instrumentation for such studies he is an author of over 500 scientific papers in journals and is an inventor of 125 patents or patent applications in addition to work on advanced materials he is involved in the development of affordable technologies for drinking water purification and some of them have been commercialized his pesticide removal technology he is estimated to have some uh, of uh, reached about 10 million people along with his associates he has incubated six companies and three of them have production units also his arsenic removal technology approved for national implementation he is delivering arsenic free water to about 1 million people every day he is a recipient of several awards including the ss batnagar award bm birla science prize national award for nano science and nano technology indian nanotech innovation innovation award jc bose national fellowship and national water award he is the winner of the third world academy of sciences prize in chemistry for the year 2018 nation conferred padma shri on him in 2020 he is also the recipient of nikkei asia prize in 2020 he is a fellow of indian national science academy indian academy of sciences national academy of sciences india indian national academy of engineering royal and royal society of chemistry the world academy of sciences and american association for advanced men of science he is a distinguished professor in a few institutions in india and also on the graduate faculty of purdue university he is the author of the introductory book nano essentials published by magro hill and is one of the authors of the monograph nano fluids published by wiley and an advanced textbook which is written a textbook of nano science and tech, nano technology published by magro hill he is on the editorial boards of journals such as acs nano chemistry of materials analytical chemistry chemical communications chemistry and asian journal nano scale nano scale horizon article Uh, scientific reports international journal of water and voice waste water treatment etc and is an associate of, editor of acs sustainable chemistry and engineering he has authored popular science books in malayalam a regional language of india and is the recipient of kerala sahitya academy award for knowledge literature in kerala he has received the lifetime achievement research award of iit madras and distinguished alumnus award of iisc bangalore as part of his philanthropic activities he supports a school in his village where 500 students are on the rolls we have got a uh, person pradeep a versatile personality to handle this session and he is going to talk about micro droplet synthesis is the most uh, uh, novel idea okay uh, thank you over to professor pradeep 
Thank you, uh, Professor Mujib. Uh, a long <laughs> introduction. And, well, it's uh, 11 o'clock now. It's about 10 minutes delayed. Uh, well, um, I will try to finish this in 35 minutes uh, or so. After Professor uh, Satyamurthy, he was talking about the early chemical reactions. Ours is going to be a little later on chemical reactions, although this particular subject matter that I'm talking to you has uh, relevance to something called astrochemistry. It's also having relevance to atmospheric chemistry in the early planet, chemical evolution of the planet. I'm not getting into those areas today, let me, I gave the title as droplet synthesis, but truly speaking, it is micro droplet synthesis. It doesn't really happen in big droplets. Uh, happens in micro droplets, meaning droplets when they are in micrometer uh, dimensions. And this subject matter is also to do with mass spectrometry. We are talking about micro droplets which are charged and the detection mostly is by mass spectrometry. So one would naturally ask this question, mass spectrometry is pretty old. The first book on mass spectrometry is, you know, is 1913. So it is a century old uh, discipline. What do you discover in such a discipline? As J.J. Thompson, who is on this uh, slide here, said this method of mass spectrometry is surprisingly sensitive, more so than that of spectrum analysis, requiring an infinitesimal amount of material and does not require this to be specially purified. The technique is not difficult if appliances for producing high aqua are available. J.J. Thompson, was prophetic, yeah. mass spectrometry expanded uh, to many areas and fantastic practitioners of uh, the subject matter are joining us uh, today as Tatsuya Tsukuda practices uh, this intensely. Mass spectrometry has expanded uh, lots of uh, different subject areas. In fact, there is no subject area of material science, physics, and chemistry, wherein mass spectrometry, biology has not expanded into uh, medicine. And everyday life depends on mass spectrometry. And this is a subject area wherein several people have won uh, Nobel Prizes. The last one was uh, in 2002. In a mass spectrometer, you have a sample and that sample is ionized to give you ions. Uh, and then these ions are mass analyzed and mass analyzed species are detected. And then the data that comes out are analyzed. These three things, ion source and mass spectrometer and detector, it, all of these are kept in a vacuum chamber. This is our standard mass spectrometry is. Now, a new thing has happened in mass spectrometry. That is normally ions are produced by electron impact, a stream of charged particles, normally electrons, they collide molecules or atoms in the gas phase and knock out an electron or sometimes add an electron and produce ions. And this is how traditional mass spectrometry is done, something called electron impact mass spectrometry. The 2002 Nobel Prize was given to people who did soft ionization, most importantly, electrospray ionization. So you produce a spray of a solution of the analyte is sprayed in an electric field 
producing charged droplets. And this is then subsequently, it converts to ions as shown here, a small nozzle. There is a solution of analyte. This analyte species are these dots now, these black dots here. And this whole needle is uh, kept at a high potential. And by pushing this liquid, uh, through that nozzle, the nozzle can be very small, something like micrometers or tens or hundreds of micrometers, you get droplets. And the droplets in the course of, as they travel to the mass spectrometer, which is the sub so for analysis of the ions, as they travel, the droplets evaporate um, solvent and there are multiple mechanisms by which ions are formed. There is something called charge residue model and ion evaporation model. These are some details we will not get into those. Uh, ions are produced and these ions are mass analyzed. Now this entire, all these nozzle and uh, ionization analysis, etc. all of these, Generally, they are all kept in a vacuum chamber, not varying degrees of vacuum. One thing happened in 2004. In 2004, uh, a person who visited Farouk College two years ago, Graham Cooks, um, he introduced a technique called desorption electrospray ionization, where these charged droplets, which are from this nozzle, they are directed to a surface and molecules sitting on the surface, which may be adsorbed molecules or components of a polymer, they get ionized. And then these ions go into the detector or mass spectrometer. So from this tip of this uh, tube, uh, you see what you see a mass spectrometer. The whole mass spectrometer is not shown here, but this entire area, this whole thing is kept in air. And the ionization occurs in air. And this is called ambient ionization. There are several ambient ionization methods in the past, uh, uh, let's say 17 years. Many, many techniques have come. Some of them are, are mentioned here. We will get to some of them in the course of uh, time. But today, such ambient ionization, these methods have become very important. For example, you can detect a molecule, say, can be a, a protein or it can be an enzyme. In your, let us say, on your tongue directly by mass spectrometry. You don't have to extract the sample, take, uh, let us say, a bud, and then take this molecule, take it in a solvent. You don't have to do all that. You don't have to send it to a laboratory. You can directly analyze it. Such methods uh, have, therefore, have a lot of possibilities. Very many subject areas uh, are being benefited by this methodology today. So this spray that I just mentioned uh, is happening from a, a tiny tip. So this tip is, can be as small as about 10 to 50 micrometers. You can buy standard tips of 50 microns uh, from regular well, online shopping. You put a solvent, a solution here, and the solution in the small wire that you see, this is a wire to take the electrical potential uh, to the solution. What you see are these droplets, like a mist that is coming in. You study this mist in great detail, there are many interesting things. That is what I'm going to tell you in the course of uh, this lecture. Many techniques have come. There are many acronyms written here. I will not uh, tell you about this, but 
uh, it is important to know that many, many techniques have come in the recent past. I'll take you to uh, a few of these examples. Uh, we showed that traditional electrospray ionization, electrospray occurs at, let us say, a few thousand volts, 2,000, 3,000, 3,500 volts. We showed that it is possible to get ionization from molecules with just three volts. Well, today we do this with one volt. And this was done by these two, at that time, students. They are postdocs today. So here is a battery, two batteries having some producing three volts DC. And there's a small paper here. On this paper, we have nanotubes, carbon nanotubes. And we put a solution of the analyte and you get a peak. And you can see this at three volts. The spectrum is almost the same as three kilovolts electrospray ionization, normal electrospray ionization. And there are many things that you can do with that. That means that you don't require a high voltage power supply. You can do mass spectrometry with a battery. Uh, and you can detect various molecules. Uh, you can detect pesticides, as shown here. You can do analytical mass spectrometry at various concentrations. You can take it to applications. So what I showed was that by a nanotube, which is nanometer in dimension, the field, electric field that you can, the solution experiences can be made to kVs or kilo electron volts of accelerating energy you can produce, kilo volts of potential you can produce, uh, several mega volts per meter field you can produce. And in that electric field, you can produce ionization and many molecules can be ionized. So the whole idea is ionization is occurring from nanostructured materials. Now we have taken this further. We take a, a nanomaterial called tellurium nanowire. So these are nanowires. You can put this on a surface. These are wires. And you put a solution there. You get, again, similar ionization. Now, one good thing or a very interesting thing is that this, these wires, let's say they are all organized, oriented in a particular direction. You rotate this direction. So instead of sitting like this, they are sitting like these. Then you can stop the ionization. So such things uh, were studied at some point in time. These are some details of that, some applications uh, of, of such methodologies. You can have these nanotubes or nanowires, put them on a surface, and I said ionization occurs. But most of the time, this ionization occurs uh, for molecules which are functional, like amines, carboxylic acids, etc. Simple molecules like uh, hydrocarbons, benzene or hexane, they don't get ionized in such cases. So how do you ionize this? We introduced a method wherein you apply a potential along with a photon. So you have well, I don't have time to get into those details of the mechanism. Essentially, you distort the potential energy surface of this molecule, and you cause ionization at a lower energy. That energy can be supplied by a, a laser at visible wavelength. So from, let us say, 10 EV as the ionization potential, you can reduce it to something like 2 EV, and then you can ionize with a photon. So you get essentially photo ionization, you detect. So this is uh, showing the mass spectrum of benzene uh, in this process. 
There are several other methods of ionization. The very recent example is that you take a molybdenum sulfide surface without even applying a potential. Uh, by just by flowing a solution, you can cause ionization. And this is, we call it uh, streaming ionization. We get uh, mass spectra uh, of, uh, of very many analytes in this process. For example, C60 is ionized by flowing a solution of C60 uh, on the surface. No potential, the entire thing is grounded. You can produce ions. And this has been used for applications as well. So I have prepared this background to tell you that you can create droplets, ionization occurs. Of late, in the past nearly six, seven years, you know, people have come to the realization that there's a lot of synthesis in happening. New bonds are formed in the droplets. This happens, this is called chemistry in these micro droplets. This happens because there is enrichment of reactants at the interface. Interface here refers to the solution air interface. There are also restricted molecular rotations. There is a pH gradient across this particular that interface. There can be reactive species such as hydrogen peroxide if the solution is aqueous. You can have partial solvation at the water surface. And there is also a strong interfacial electric field. So using this examples like these, so th this is now an aldehyde becoming an alcohol. Several such chemical reactions have happened. Now I'm going to summarize all of these in this slide to say that you can have charged or uncharged micro droplets coming through these sprays. The charge is because of the electric field. Uncharged could be because of something called a pneumatic force is pushing the solution forming droplets, meaning high pressure. Now you can have reactions happening in these droplets, or you can have a reactant coming in through one spray, another reactant coming through another spray, droplet fusion occurs, or droplet droplet collisions occur at the interface, interesting things happen. This is of some great importance uh, to aerosol chemistry and uh, early atmospheric chemistry. It's also possible that these droplets can hit on surfaces and you can get uh, chemical reactions. Droplets can be formed in this kind of, uh, with an air cushion called levitated droplets and reactions can happen there. Droplets can interact with liquid surfaces, reactions happen there. All of these are possible. To show you an example, what uh, was done very recently this is a molecule called benzimidazole. Uh, this is that benzimidazole. You can have various functionalized benzimidazoles. And it, this can happen by a chemical reaction between this diamine and the formal, formic acid. Now, here is that example. Here is this diamine. And in presence of, uh, without formic acid, you get this particular ion, that is this diamine, and no product is there. You have with formic acid, you get a product here, and this is the species, which is this benzimidazole. Now, of course, this is a chemical reaction happening just in this droplet, just because A and B are in, in that droplet. Now, if you take uh, in the solution and stir it, nothing happens. You make a large droplet, nothing happens. In micro droplets in this charge condition, you can produce it as a charged ion. You can also get a molecule. You can characterize with NMR or any such technique. It's not that this is the only thing that happens. There are a number of reactions like addition, elimination, 
addition elimination, oxidation and reduction, multi-component reactions. People have studied this uh, in great detail. Very many chemical reactions happen. So the message here is that droplets are not carrying just these molecules, they are undergoing transformation. Now, such a droplet chemistry, imagine this were to happen in, in a bottle. Let us say here is a droplet that is falling into this bottle and uh, you can collect a product, not uh, necessarily ions going into the mass spectrometer. You can get this kind of quantities. So what it means is that synthetic chemistry is possible and that can be preparative in nature. And that preparative chemistry can be done for a large number of molecules. So that is custom synthesis is possible. Now I'm going to switch gears and then tell you uh, that it is possible to do this uh, for nanomaterials. Uh, instead of, let us say, in this particular case, there is this wire which is made of gold. And the, solu the solvent here is acetonitrile. There is some electro corrosion that can happen and some gold ions can be there in the solution. And without any reducing agent, you can create nanoparticles. And what comes out are gold ions. You can show with mass spectrometry. And you can characterize this very well. Um, okay. Now, we did one very interesting experiment. These droplets that are coming down, they are forming particles. These particles are falling down on surfaces. But when these particles are fall or being created, another particle is coming. And you can create a chain of such particles called, you can have a fiber or a nanowire, uh, so to say. So we have, this is possible and it can be highly uniform. So here is a transmission electron microscopic grid and these are fibers and I'm expanding this. This is what happens and necklace of such particles. Now this can be long, you can do this for a long time. You can grow this, you can grow this in large, uh, reasonably a long, uh, uh, particle or wires can be created. They can be dense like these. And you can use this for spectroscopy. We can do this for experiments such as surface enhanced Raman. Uh, you can, each one of these particles, you can image by something called uh, dark field microscopy. You can collect their plasmon spectrum and you can show that they are of different sizes, compositions, whatever. So all of this is possible. Now, when such particles or uh, wires are produced, you can trap uh, dust, for example, or you can trap bacteria, for example. So all of these are applications that you can do. Now you can vary the composition. You can do catalysis with particles. I'm going to switch this to something else. So if you can grow these particles, electrospray-based synthesis of materials over areas, you can also create something like this, which we call a nano brush. Now such a brush, um, if you keep, if you, if you compare such a brush with, um, with let us say this cacti, you see that these brushes are comparable to these thorns. On the thorns, if you cool them, Below the dew point, you can create, let us say, droplets. And you can collect these droplets. And there are natural examples. In nature, there are plenty of examples wherein such water that is harvested is used for survival, such as these beetles do that or cacti do that. So how about creating such uh, surfaces and collecting water? So here is uh, uh, a surface. And in the course of this surface is, is a, an optical micrograph. You can't see the wires here because an optical microscopy. But in the course of time from 60 seconds, 120 seconds, et cetera, uh, with a normal surface, you don't collect a lot of uh, water. But on these kinds of surfaces, wherein there are nanowires, 
uh, you collect much larger quantity of uh, water. So here is a video to show you how this uh, dust is being collected, uh, this taking you to industry. So here is such a surface and uh, air is drawn from outside and on the surface, we are going to ask this question, can water be collected? Uh, and here is a movie to tell you. So here is such a surface because it is a regular camera picture. You don't see any nano wire, et cetera, but you see water being collected right? mm -hmm. uh, and water collection is pretty, uh, pretty good. The rate of collection you can compare over a from in comparison to a regular surface. Uh, and you can ask how much of energy is needed for water collection. You can build that into a larger scale and uh, you can have a company. So you can build a, um, a product such as this. And that has resulted in an organized uh, organization today. I'm coming to the last bit of this uh, talk uh, to say that these droplets, what else can you do? So one thing that uh, we, uh, we do in our laboratory or we make in our laboratory nanoparticles. But at the moment you do chemical synthesis of nanoparticles, you get something called a polydispersed nanoparticle. Nanoparticles are of all kinds of sizes. When you take these nanoparticles and put it through this droplet, the exactly the same kind of synthesis that I showed you or told you about, we were surprised to see that these polydispersed particles become highly monodispersed. In fact, some regions you can see particle order uh, of, of this kind. And this is all happening at uh, room temperature in air. There is another methodology, such polydispersed particles, if you anneal at a high temperature in solution for a week, uh, you can get monodispersed particles. So essentially, you are doing all of these processes so fast uh, in, in, in ambient electrospray. Now, this is not just some region. So we take a large area and you say that oh, this electrospray is happening over a, a large, reasonably large area that T can image, very monodispersed, expanded, further expanded. You see that this is what happens uh, to the particles. Now, when a droplet is falling and on the surface, you can vary a number of parameters. For example, you can vary the uh, distance from the tip to the surface. And you see that at a, an optimal distance, you get such uh, organized particles. You also vary potential at a given specific potential. You see that such, such things happen. Other potentials, they don't do this. You can vary things like flow rate and solvent and say that uh, this happens in certain conditions. And you then, uh, with a number of studies, you then build a mechanism. So essentially what happens is that in a droplet, you create what are called these particles are protected with thiols. So what you have are metal thiolates are on the surface. Now, if you start, you, are, you think that these particles are decomposing to thiolates and then thiolates are reassembling uh, to give you metal particles. So in order to sort of test this hypothesis that particles are becoming thiolates, we make thiolates and then ask the question whether they form particles. And we also spray and under, at a particular distance, uh, you also collect the material and show that there are thiolates being formed uh, in the soil in this during spray. You can take one particular um, monolayer, or you can have other monolayer forming thiolates also, like ethane thiol or dimethyl benzene thiol, all of them also make these uniform particles starting from a polydispersed particle. It is a generic method. From such monodispersed particle, you can create thin films on surfaces. So these are freestanding thin films with highly yeah. uniform particles. They are not of regular order, uh, however. So what I just told you is that very many interesting things happen. So why is that uh, they are happening? One uh, reason could be these uh, Laplace pressure, but in a monolayer, 
the Laplace pressure is not so high in comparison to atmospheric pressure. Here, the kind of a few mic microns, Laplace pressure is a little bit higher than atmospheric pressure. There is a possible change in pH. There are surface effects. There are concentration gradients. We wanted to see, are there, all these things are really there in micro droplets. So here is a nanoparticles in suspension. You spray it. You collect this nanoparticle suspension. So you get droplets. These micro droplets contain nanoparticles. Now, using nanoparticles, you can image these droplets, and these are those uh, particles there. So you see an image. Now, what do you see in this in great detail is that if you look at, there are many particles wherein a lot of particle concentration happens on the surfaces. Now, we traced the evolution of a droplet, and we found that droplets can be this kind quite uniform, and then the particles start uh, segregating, and you see essentially surface segregation within these droplets. And we image these with uh, nanoparticles, nano rods, and we understand that such a unif segregation is indeed real. At the interface, therefore, interface concentrations are very different and the chemistry is happening at the interface. This is what we found as a conclusion of the study. A range of chemical reactions can be done, can be monitored. They all occur uh, on the surfaces. Um, and this was done by a few of my students. Our research group is very big. And most of the work on, uh, well, metal clusters, clean water, uh, and some uh, study micro droplet chemistry also. I chose to talk about this uh, chemistry today because this micro droplet chemistry in the lab was seeded by Graham Cooks. Graham Cooks uh, was your uh, a speaker at uh, a previous EFCS, EFCS3. And this is when Professor Graham Cooks, along with many of you from the college, visited Baypur. This science was done uh, with the support of the Department of Science and Technology. Thank you very much. Hello, we have uh, space for one or two questions. Participants. Um, Professor Mujib, are they in a position to unmute and ask questions? Um, I don't know whether people are allowed to unmute. Unmute, yeah. yes. yes. Yes, they uh, can. They can unmute. They can do. Okay, so yes, you brother. can unmute and then ask your questions. Yes. Yes. Well, I well, I don't have a specific question, but I must compliment uh, Pradeep for a wonderful talk. And a lot of droplet chemistry, which is of practical importance. Uh, one question is, you showed the uh, machine which allows you to collect uh, water. Uh, is that uh, commercially available now? Uh, in, in, uh, this one, yeah, this one is, uh, is commercially available. We have a okay. startup company. Okay, okay. And what is the I didn't problem? show that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is uh, <laughs> cost-wise 110 liters per day. Uh, uh -huh. atmospheric water collector today with all the GST and all, uh, it is pretty high, but uh, 1.74 lakhs. That's okay. That is a, pr it's a proof of concept. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. We are, uh, we are having 35 liters, 100, 100 liters, uh, five, 400 liters, 1000 liters and 2000 liters per day units. Okay. We, we yeah. all have to appreciate the effort and the novelty Professor Pradeep is moving from one uh, area to another area, depending upon the need of the hour, need of the hour, oxygen generating machine he has. Very, very proud of you, Professor Pradeep. If there is no other question, uh, we shall just put it off to another occasion.
or an interval from professor pradeep will be available i think this is it is it yeah yeah i will be available certainly okay if you all of you agree with me we shall have a uh, great thanks to professor pradeep for his uh, excellent talk and presentation thank you